Hello, everyone. We are going to get started now, and Erica is going to kick us off with an introduction about the book that we're talking about today and about, I'm sure, Poetry Translation Center. Thank you, Erica. Go ahead. Take it away. Hi. Hello, and a warm welcome to you all. Uh, my name is Erica Hesketh, and I'm the director of the Poetry Translation Center. We are a charity based in London in the UK, and we're dedicated to publishing, promoting, and generally celebrating poets and poetries from around the world in English translation, as well as the art of translation itself. I'm delighted that so many of you could join us tonight for this very special online launch, which is held in partnership with Arablit, of the latest book in the Poetry Translation Center's World Poet series, I Will Not Fold These Maps, by the amazing Mona Karim, uh, in a brilliant, luminous translation by the poet and translator Sarah L. Camel. Got the book here. I'm sure many of you are here because you're already fans of Mona Karim. Uh, for those of you who are new to her work, you're really in for a huge treat tonight. The poems in this selection are extraordinary. They are delicate. They're challenging. They effortlessly tread that line between the personal and the political in a way that is awe-inspiring. It was such a pleasure to be in proximity to Mona's work during the publication of this book, and I really hope it will find the wide audience that it deserves. Um, now, this book, like all books, is the product of collaboration. Many hands have helped to carry it into the world. But I really want to give a special thank you at this time to Nashua Nasraldine, who, as well as being um, an, an editor with Arab Lit, was the associate editor on I Will Not Fold These Maps and has been a central collaborator from the start of this project. Uh, so Nashua, your skill and sensitivity have been essential to the success of this book, and I'm really glad that we got to work with you on this. Um, I uh, I understand that Mona is on her way, um, but we're going to start the event um, handing over to M. Lynx Quayley, who's the founding editor of Arablet, as you know, who's going to introduce the rest of the event and the speakers. Um, and I'd just like to sign off my part with a huge congratulations to Mona, Sarah, and to Nashua, and uh, with an encouragement to you all to buy and enjoy this beautiful book if you haven't already. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Erica. Um, and I would I would echo that. I really en have enjoyed this collection a lot, um, both the poems and and also the the commentary that that comes around it. So I'm going to just start with a little bit of housekeeping, um, and and that is uh, please use the comments uh, and use them both for use them for three things. Um, the comments just to say hello and where you're coming in from today. I think everyone always or I always like to see those sorts of things. Questions, please put in questions at any point. Um, and, and then we will uh, sort them out, taking questions at the end. And also we're taking requests. So if you have a particular poem uh, that you would like Mona or Sada to read, then we would be happy to also take requests. We not necessarily promising, but uh, as with questions, but, but we're also taking requests. So um, probably if you're at this event, you already know the, um, the principles involved. But I will just briefly introduce everyone. Mona Karim is the author of three poetry collections. Her poetry has been translated into nine languages and appeared in English in Poetry, Poetry Northwest, Michigan Quarterly, Poetry London, Modern Poetry and Translation, among others. She was a recipient of a 2021 literary grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. Karim holds a PhD in comparative literature and works as an assistant professor of Middle East studies at Washington University, St. Louis. Her translations include Atra Fayyad's Instructions Within, which was um, long listed for a Best Translated Book Award, and Ra'id Abdul Qadr's Except for the Sunseen Thread, and then from, from the English to Arabic, Octavia Butler's um, seminal science fiction novel, Kindred. Sara El Kamel is a poet, journalist, translator based in Cairo. She holds an MA in Arts Journalism from Columbia and an MFA in Poetry from NYU. Her poems have appeared in Poetry Magazine, Plowshares, The Iowa Review, etc. 
And in the anthologies, Best New Poets, tw uh, 2020 and 2022, Best of the Net 20, she was named winner of the Redividers 2021 Blurred Genre Contest. And Tinderbox's 2022 Brett Elizabeth Jenkins Poetry Prize, her debut chapbook, Field of No Justice, was published by the African Poetry Book Fund and Akashic Books in 2021. And since we published this bio, I think two days ago, it was announced that she's the winner of the 2022 Goldstein Prize for Poetry for In the Footsteps of Anayata Zayet, which is so exciting, will be appearing in Michigan Quarterly Review in this, this summer. Can't wait to see it. Nashwa Nasreddin is a writer, editor, and a translator of Arabic literature. She is the translator of the collaborative novel Shatila Stories from Pyrene Press and Talib al Rafai's novel Shadow of the Sun, which is forthcoming from Bonapal Books. She's a contributing editor at Arab Lit and Arab Lit Quarterly and holds an MFA in poetry from the Vermont College of Fine Arts. And of course, importantly, is um, an editor of, of the editor of, of this poetry collection. Um, so, I will just, as we wait on Mona, I'm going to shift to starting with Sara. And I wanted to, to start with this figure of the poet translator, which uh, is a figure that appears in, in Mona's poetry. Uh, and, and, and I was particularly interested in a poem that's not in this collection, the poet translator, at which you also have translated Sara. And I wondered if through the process of spending so much time with Mona's poetry, as Saidi is sort of described as spending with Walt Whitman and Ellen Ginsberg, how or whether Mona works her way into your poetry. And we can see already Iman Marcel has worked her way into your poetry. Uh, yeah, thank you so much uh, for that intro, Marsha. And uh, thank you to Nashua who uh, edited the book and to Erica Hesketh and the Poetry Translation Center for publishing it. Um, I'm very excited. Uh, and Mona is too. Um, and she'll be with us very soon. Um, okay, so the Poet Translator. I think that's a great question. Um, since both Mona and I are poet translators. And I think I'll take a step back and, and uh, tell you uh, a bit about how we met in the first place. Um, so we met through Tames, um, which is um, a yearly uh, poetry translation workshop that happens sometimes in Paris, sometimes remotely. Um, it keeps moving around, but uh, it was co-founded by Sarah Riggs, who is a wonderful poet and translator from French. Um, and we were both part of the seminar, the, the workshop, the seminar um, in 2020, I believe, uh, or 2021. Uh, the years are all meshing into one another. Um, and 2021 yes I'm sure um but yeah and um we were actually not working together during um the seminar so the idea of the seminar is that you get paired with um another poet and then you translate one another across languages so I was working with the poet Aya Nabi um an Egyptian poet living in Cairo who I really really admire um and we were translating one another and um, I believe Mona was working with Safa Fathi, um, and they were translating each other's works. But then what's great about the seminar is that every day we meet for uh, like an hour or so, all the pa different pairs of poet translators, and we talk and um, take each other's uh, opinions on challenges or um, or just share, you know, anecdotes from what happened through throughout the day of, of uh, working together. Um, and then I think Mona and I started having a conversation after that seminar. Um, and here comes Mona. Um, so yeah, I think I'll let Mona speak first on um, the poet translator and then we can come back to me. Hi, I can't hear you. 
I am on mute. Okay. So you missed your introduction, but you already know yourself. So <laughs> yes, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, it was so wonderful to have you here. Uh, so we were talking about the figure of the poet translator and, and Sada brought us through a little bit about how you met in, in that workshop uh, organized by Sarah Riggs. And, and so I wanted you know, to, to ask you to talk about the role of the poet translator and how you see the poet translator, um, particularly you, you know, in the context both of, of America, which I think has been in some ways unfriendly to this you know, um, role of the poet translator and, and just in general um, and the role in Arabic letters, et cetera. So go ahead, Mona. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, first I would like to thank you, Marcia, and for Arablet, um, Neshwa also for making this book happen. And Sarah, I don't know where she disappeared. The She's the ghost of the translator. <laughs> no, <laughs> you, you can turn it off. <laughs> um, but um, I was going to say, um, um, because, you know, this is a figure that I've always been thinking around and um, um, thinking with, learning from, um, but also um, in my new book, um, new collection of po poems that will come out next year, um, I try to actually pay tribute to such figures, you know, including, um, you noticed, uh, Sadi Youssef, uh, Sargon Bolas. Um, and I started to pay attention to this figure because, um, you know, when, when I was in the Arab world and Arabic was all of, all of my world, like I took it for granted, this figure. And I assumed that every, um, poet, um, if they are not bilingual, but they would be eager for another language as a way of, um, you know, finding a way to to change poetics from within, you know. So when we look at the translations of that Said Yusuf has done, and then simultaneously the poetry he was writing, you was, you see a lot of crossover. You see these figures coming from here and going there. You see phrases, you know, and in his translations. Um, his translations are unique, you know, when you read Kavafi and Sadi's translation, it's, it's his, you know, it's not, it's not um, anyone else's. Um, so I love this blurring between translation and, you know, uh, the original. And I love this use of translation as a poetics, as a generator of poetics, um, but also um, um, as um, you know, it 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 unsettles Arabic from within. You know, it it um, gives it an, a new soul, a new um, um, air to it. Um, so um, I guess I started to think then about the poet translator more as a more complex figure than just a literati. You know, you start to realize that you know, uh, for example, when you are in a different scene than your linguistic scene, you are necessarily always translating. You know, a poem is always a translation. You are constantly in a, you know, a process of um, um, translation. Um, and the beautiful thing about translation that you can't find um, in, in everyday, let's say in contemporary scenes is that you are allowed to have conversations with poets from all, ages and genres and languages, you know, and geographies, you know. So um, I, I like this superpower that is in, in translation. And I think it is something that poets uh, should should claim more uh, bluntly. And I also was thinking that when I was reading your, your questions is there is a poem that fits every question that I can read and, and Sarah can read the translation as well. Excellent. So Sara, now I'm going to go back to you to finish the second part of the question, now that Mona has taken the first. Uh, yeah, I, um, so yeah, can you repeat the question? <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> so uh, the, in, in this, this poem, The Poet Translator, so Walt Whitman really like kind of comes into Saidi Yusuf's poetry and, and Allen Ginsberg. And I wondered if through the process of translating Mona, how she inhabits your, your poetry or, or doesn't now. Um, I think I'll be 
I'll be curious how my answer to this question changes the longer we work together, Mona and I. Um, I think uh, for now, the, the influence is definitely there uh, just by virtue of my practice of translating so much of her work. So uh, over the past year and a half, um, I've read her uh, three published collections and, and, and unpublished work in progress and translated around a hundred pages. Um, and so I think because I'm very much in this mode of translation, um, I'm learning from the process itself. So for example, um, I feel like translation forces me to really experiment with syntax and sentence structure uh, because uh, the meaning is really dependent on sentence structure when you translate. Um, so that's like one of the elements that can either uphold the meaning or change it or tweak it. Um, and I'm in general, I'm really obsessed with the sentence as a unit. So I'm really happy that I'm I'm getting through translation and retranslation and drafting um, to just play around with syntax and explore its uh, various potentials, especially that sometimes it's really awkward if you translate verbatim um, across languages. And then I enjoy the awkwardness in that. Um, and then, so I've started in my own poetry to experiment with different sentence structures and sometimes a bit awkward or worthy sentence structures. Um, but I'm really enjoying that. It's in a way I'm looking at my own sentences when I write poetry as um, in the same way or in a similar way that I'm looking at Mona's work when I translate it. Um, so that's that's been a great workout for my like syntax muscle, I think. Um, and then, yeah, I, I also think that Mona's writing, um, I'm very drawn to her uh, fragments or the poems that exist in fragments. Um, and so I'm, and I've been timid uh, about trying that in my own work, but lately I have been working um, more in that direction. Um, and, and then also, I think I'm very lucky that Mona is around and that we're, uh, we have like a very open channel of communication. So uh, another way that she influences my work is that she reads my work um, and we can have conversations um, around each other's works and, and give feedback, not just in the capacity of like me as the translator and like the, um, I think the roles aren't very static between us, which is um, wonderful for, for my work as well. Excellent, thank you so much. So uh, Nashua, you already know that um, to, to me, editing poetry is somewhat of a magical process and that I'm very nervous about it. Um, and generally speaking, when poetry comes into the magazine, I try to foist it on you instantly because as I, um, as I sort of walk around the process of editing a, a poetry translation, uh, I always feel that I'm going to break something. <laughs> and I wondered if you could talk about the role of the editor when working with poetry and translation and how it's different or not different from, from working with prose and translation or other forms. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Marsha. And I just want to echo everybody else's thanks as well. I mean, especially to Mona and Sara for you know sharing your beautiful work with us, which is so excited to have been able to publish this collection here in the UK and to the Poetry Translation Center for not only sort of running with it, but getting so excited with us as well. It's been really, really wonderful so far. Um, and yeah, in terms of editing poetry versus prose, there, there's a lot that I can say, but I also wanted to say that it's very different. Um, obviously, you know, any every editor will have their own process. Will, um, and I'm sure even sort of Mona and Sara would be able to kind of say from their own experiences of either editing their own or editing someone else's poetry. Um, that, you know, it's a, it's a very personal thing. Um, for me, I would say there is a there's a big difference, actually, when I'm editing prose, I, um, I don't tend to put the two sort of languages next to each other, the two texts next to each other. I'll generally sort of try to read the Arabic prose and um, read the English and kind of 
have get a general sense of what's working and what's not working and maybe sort of refer to the Arabic whenever there's a word that I feel like either it jars in translation or I'm just curious about. Whereas with poetry, I always open them up and side by side and I go through them line by line. And that's kind of, I would have read it, I would have read the translation in English because it would have been submitted in some form anyway. But my first kind of deep um, experience of the poem will be line by line in both languages. Maybe because I always think in both languages, you know, being bilingual from birth. Um, but I, I prefer to go through and look at the word choices um, and the phrasings first and get all my questions out in the open initially have that discussion with the translator without sort of correcting anything or amending anything or suggesting anything, just querying, you know, at that stage. Um, but then the most important part comes later for me, which is the listening. And that's what I would say I do, you know, most intensely when I'm editing poetry more than with prose, which is just to read and listen to the uh, the music and the rhythm, the, the sounds of both um, the Arabic original and the English, um, not to make sure that they match in any way, but that they somehow, you know, speak to each other. And for that, sometimes that editing poetry can take me a much longer time because I need to be in the right frame of mind and I need to be in a quiet space. Whereas, because I've got to listen, you know, I've got to use my ears really, really well, but um, editing prose I can do with noise around me, you know, at some point I will need to concentrate and read it at the very end. But with a poem, I do need to, to have the space around me to be, yeah, um, very quiet and conducive to that listening side. But I also want to say that it really depends on the work that you're getting as well and what kind of stage it's in. And I mean, it can be a really fulfilling process, whatever, so the stage that it comes in at. But um, working with someone like Sara, you know, it's just a dream because she sort of delivered the poems in such a polished state that initially I was kind of thinking, you know, what is there for me to do, <laughs> you know? But of course, it's a conversation and it develops. And, you know, if you even look at the margins and the, the discussion that we have, it's so fascinating that I always kind of think it's be interesting to kind of publish that separately, you know, because we have all these long conversations in the margins. And um, and also, you know, Sarah has very strong opinions, obviously, because of her work, because she spent so much time on it. But, um, she, you know, she'll push back if I make a suggestion or a comment that she doesn't like, which I love, you know, I love it when someone's kind of thinking, no, you know, I chose that for a specific reason. Um, and then we can sort of go off on a tangent and start discussing something else entirely and then come back again. But like she was saying, you know, the, the fact that Mona is also bilingual and able um, to have those conversations and willing, you know, and available between them I always know that I'm not just having a conversation with Sarah that then she goes off and she has a conversation with Muna and then she might come back and say actually Muna prefers this version and I think well you know then we're sort of having a three-way dialogue um so yeah it's it's been I feel sort of just very fortunate to have had this dynamic with the two of them and to have been able to kind of play a part yeah that sounds ideal actually in in a in a language pairing where so often it is only the you know the the translator who's who's reading it and then passing it off to an editor who may not have any access to the language at all to have three people involved in in the process is amazing so um i wondered if we could do our first reading um it doesn't matter to me which direction we go in um whether the arabic is first or the english is first arabic uh, okay sure yeah um can you hear me well Yes. Okay. Yeah, because I'm next to a kitchen, so I don't know how to silence them. <laughs> but uh, I hope the I hope that people can understand the poem. الشاعر المهجري يذبح صوته في صيف حارق أحرق من الصيف الماضي وأبرد من التالي نزل الشاعر من الجنوب الأعلى إلى الجنوب الأدنى. نزل ثم وقف على حافة الصخرة وذبح صوتا هكذا بكل هدوء رمشت عيناه الضيقتان بانزعاج لم يقرأ الفاتحة ولم يحدد لله لمن يهدي هذا القربان لقد زهق الشاعر من كون صوته استعارة أراد أن يرى دم صوته شحمه ولحمه حسبه ونسبه أن يسمع اهتزاز الحبال حتى لو تكلفه لفظة الموت لفظة الموت في لغتنا يجد نفسه مقدما الاسم على الفعل 
لوثة الأنا الغنائية ربما يقطف كلمات تيبست حتى استحالت ذهبا ينفض عنها غبار القرون ثم يغرسها في أصص صغيرة يظن الشاعر أن بإمكانه إبراء الأكم وإحياء الموتى أما في لغتهم يقطع الجبال والمحيطات تاركا طلاسم على كل شجرة كي لا يستحيل إلى مرايا يأتي بجبل من سفوح كاليفورنيا ثم يلقي به في خليج المكسيك ليطفو ثانية فوق أنبوب نفط كل صباح أستيقظ على صوته أوصد الشباك في وجهه لأكمل نومي أتركه يلخبط الساعات يحدثني عن قصيدة النثر كيف تقف كجذع أجرد قاطعة الأفق لقد سرقوا موسيقانا ولم يتبقى سوى الصوت يصلني مع فارق التوقيت مريضا بالأرق مثقلا بالبدايات عالقا كصرخة أزنية في هوة الوقت Gorgeous. Uh, thank you, Mona. I'm, I'm going to read uh, the English transla translation of the poem, which is titled, The Migrant Poet Slaughters His Voice. One scorching summer, hotter than the previous summer and cooler than the next, the poet journeyed from the upper south to the lower south. He descended and at the fringe of a rock slaughtered his voice. Just like that, calmly, his narrow eyes squinting in distress. He did not read Al-Fatiha, nor did he pledge the sacrifice to Allah. The poet was exasperated that his voice had become a metaphor. He wanted to see the blood of his voice, its grease and flesh, its lineage, to hear its chords vibrating, even if a single utterance would cost him his life. In our language, he finds himself placing nouns before verbs, tainted by the lyrical eye, perhaps. He picks words that had wilted until they turned to gold. Wiping away the dust of centuries, he plants them in small pots. The poet thinks he can heal the dumb and revive the dead. Meanwhile, in their language, he crosses mountains and oceans, leaving a talisman on every tree to escape entrapment in mirrors. He hauls a mountain from the slopes of California and flings it into the Gulf of Mexico, before it floats once again atop an oil pipeline. Every morning I wake up to his voice, I slam the window shut and go back to, his, to sleep. I let him jumble the clocks, talk to me about the prose poem, how it stands like a bare trunk interrupting the horizon. They have stolen our music, but nothing and nothing's left but the voice that preaches me across time zones, afflicted with insomnia, burden, burdened with beginnings, hanging like an eternal cry in the chasm of time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sara. That was beautiful. Um, so I, I wanted to talk uh, about humor in the collection. And uh, I would start by sort of admitting my own sort of poor poetic education. I used to think that humor and poetry was a sign of sort of unseriousness. I guess there is a certain sort of light poetry that is unserious. Um, but now I think much more about humor as this very difficult to execute technique in, in poetry. Um, but I also somehow associated with women, I associated with Iman's poetry, Maya Abul Hayat, um, with Mona's poetry, which really appears a lot in this collection, I think. Um, and, and sometimes things, you know, turn on a dime, like um, a poem, the poem is, is scary to me or, <laughs> um, or, or, you know, very serious and then playful. And, and I wondered if, Mona, if, if humor has always been a part of your, your poetry um, and where it, where it comes from. Um, yeah, thank you for this question because it uh, reminded me like that, yeah, actually humor came later in, into my poetry. I mean, I, I totally agree with you. I've always thought also it's unserious <laughs> to, uh, to joke also maybe 
maybe wondered how how do you even you know put humor into into poetry and i think you know um the poets that i were reading i did not i was not attracted to their humor maybe um uh, a lot of the humor that is in arabic poetry <clears throat> is necessarily like political satire so it was a very specific genre that i wasn't you know uh, practicing but then um over time i start to realize like there is a power to humor um in really in every genre uh, as uh, as a relief but also it allows you to approach um subjects and experiences that are very difficult and violent right so um you know if you are trying to avoid um reproducing uh, uh violence or trauma um um as it is if you are trying to you know distill something in it that evokes something that makes it you know relatable um or you know uh, accessible to a stranger right to make it vulnerable um humor plays a beautiful role there you know and i remember maybe the first poem that i wrote with humor i actually wrote it funny enough i wrote it in uh in english and it was after um um was maybe in 2017 when i um was uh, searched at the airport and it felt very humiliating so i wrote the poem it's a very short poem i wrote the poem but then right away i found myself mocking the police woman who like searched me and it felt like um i was able to take something back right by mocking her you know it felt like um and somehow i felt like i liberated my myself from that awful you know experience the memory stays of course but you know i don't have to every time i remember it i don't have to only remember it um uh through her lens right like what she had done to me had done to me um i was able to like reverse it in a way um so before that one poem like the humor would would show up more as you know sarcasm you know and i think it's like we are okay to use uh, um you know dark comedy because we think that's intelligent right <laughs> um you know some kind of satirical um play it was very subtle you know i never embraced it i never went, allowed myself to explore it but after that moment when i saw like how there was something therapeutic about it i just you know i was just like oh you know there i can do this all the time <laughs> you know i can always write about whatever I want and, you know, um, use humor as a way of, um, um, you know, so to speak, breaking the fourth wall and, and, and making connection with the reader. And, um, and I, and I, you see it also even, you know, in, in my essays as well, you know, I, maybe I would do it more in a, in a snarky way, but really I, I began to pay attention to all my favorite writers and noticing how like this snarky, humor or like you know um sometimes it's just you know comedic um um it generates something and and it just like really shifts like the relations and sometimes it makes people uncomfortable but in a good way you know uncomfortable in a way that um brings them to to question some some conceptions or um um even even aesthetic expectations that they have Thank you so much. That was so interesting. And I just have to say, this was, I cannot remember the last time I laughed out loud while reading a poetry book. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. So Sara, I wanted to ask you about translating humor in, when people talk about translating in humor and prose, it is sort of this kind of holy grail. And, and I think it, it's because the humor that's often in prose is so embedded in a specific cultural context um, and, and can't necessarily be taken out of this kind of linguist. I don't feel that about this poetry that it's like all about culture, you know, specific moments or cultural illusions. It's much more playful, but I wondered if there was any um, challenge to, that was particular to translating the humor here of getting it right, making sure that it it you know it echoed in the same way. Um, yeah, I mean, thank you for for drawing my attention to um, the the issue of humor because I think I I didn't really think about it uh, 
as I was translating or I wasn't trying to get it right. Um, I think to me, I was thinking, oh, this is a different texture in the language or a different tone and not necessarily this is funny. Um, and I think maybe one reason for that was uh, because I, I'm doing this uh, in a kind of in a vacuum or or just me and the text and the texts and then like the Google Doc conversations with, with Mona or Nashua. But um, I think humor is something that's really created in the space between um, the writer and the reader um, of a piece of work. So when, when I was in New York and I was doing readings, sometimes uh, there would be humor in my own work, but I, I wouldn't realize it until someone laughed uh, when I read it out loud. Um, and I actually remember I translated a poem by a friend um, and a writer I admire, Farah Barqawi, a Palestinian writer. Uh, I translated a prose poem by her and we both read it in New York at the same reading, her in Arabic and me in English. Uh, and people laughed so much when she was reading it and when I was reading it, nothing. <laughs> um, so, so that, um, I don't know, I think, I think going back to the textures and and you you um, alluded to this, Marsha, earlier when when you said that sometimes a poem you can enter it and and at, at the beginning it can come across as scary or uh, threatening somehow and then it flips very suddenly, and I think that's the challenging um, that's the biggest challenge with translating Mona's work because it feels like it's it's standing on very shaky ground on so many different levels. So um, the, the textures of the language change. Uh, sometimes it's interspersing narrative elements with uh, very lyric elements. Um, there, um, there's just subject matter wise, there's also variations. And um, so I feel like the one poem, even if it's really, short there it's a journey and I and I have to decide whether I'm just going to go with the journey or um flatten it which is really heartbreaking to say but I think uh I'm working against this impulse somehow to even the tone and to make it um and I I think tense is one thing that um that gets really muddled in translation because uh, I, I, I think Arabic writing is more um, flexible with tense, but then like one thing that as an editor or like a, a translator, um, you go in and you're like, oh, this is not consistent. And you, you have to like make things um, make sense. And I think I have to constantly silence that voice of like, oh, this needs to make sense in uh, whatever preconceived ways that we think sense uh, should look like. Um, but yeah, so I think what I've done is to um, sometimes extend the qualities in the language that um, are associated with humor. So for example, um, hyperbole. Um, so in one unpublished poem uh, that I really, really love, uh, its title is Absence Without Arms. So like already the, the title is really uh, intense. Uh, there's one stanza that says, in your absence, I did nothing unnatural. I archived my dreams, okay? And it goes on. And then I'm like, and I don't remember what the word archived was in the Arabic, but I feel like archived is such a heavy um, word to then contrast with what came before. I did nothing un unnatural. And then to like think of this uh, very arduous task of archival. Um, so maybe I like sometimes just use the bigger words to, to, to create more of a contrast. Um, and then also, Mona uses, or she keeps making up these uh, occupations. So there's like a death policeman, there's disease police. Um, and I think maybe one option I could have had was to tame these um, terms and like use policeman of death and, and not capitalize, for example, but I like preserve it and like capitalize police policemen and death to make it like seem like an occupation to 
maybe extend that um, humorous uh, tone. So yeah, I, I think I'm still experimenting with, with how to preserve um, the playfulness, but um, yeah. That's really fantastic. Thank you, Sara. Uh, and I, 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 I really appreciate what you say about not flattening the tone because some of really the joy of some of the poems is how they tonally change and take you on this immense um, journey back into different spaces. Um, so one of the poems that I really like for its humor is My Body, My Vehicle. And so I wondered if both of you could read that and now we won't be able to hear whether people are laughing only at the Arabic and not at the English, but. <laughs> okay. Um, جسدي مركبتي. جسدي مركبتي. أقودها مثل مراهق مستهتة. تصطدم بالآخرين بالأرصفة. تجتاز الإشارة الحمراء في الثانية الأخيرة. فيهز شبطي الموت رأسه. أحياناً. أفقد ملامحا أو خصلة أو عضوا ولا أجد قطع غيار في السكراب خسرت شفاهي الفضية وقلبي المغطى بالشحوم وخسرت قبعتي المتحركة ثم يدي اليسرى التي أرى من خلالها الآخرين مثل رجل كندي في أيام الأثنين أشغلها بهدوء وأجرف الثلج من حولها أدعها تسخن وتصحصح تستعيد حواسها فلا مركبة تنهض من السرير مستعدة لمواجهة العالم في الغرفة أدعها تحوم كلما اختنقت الفكرة تخدش أظافرها المهملة خشب الأرض بانتظار اللغة تخرج والغصة تزول ما الذي علي فعله بمركبتي هذه لا يمكنني ركنها وهجرها في أي مكان حين أذهب للتسوق تحطم عجلاتي السراميك اللامة وحين أنزل إلى البحر تنغرس في الرمال صغيرة وسمراء ومحطمة سجاجها سجل الريح وصوتها يتداعى في ساعة في ساعة الزحام. Okay, um, thank you, Mona. Um, okay, so this is my body, my vehicle. My body is my vehicle. I drive her like a reckless teen. She crashes into others, into sidewalks. She breaks red lights at the last second as the death policeman shakes his head. Sometimes I lose one of my features, a strand of hair or an organ, and I find no spare parts in the junkyard. I lost my silver lips and my grease-coated heart, <clears throat> and I lost my rotating hat, then my left hand, and with it, my peripheral vision. Like a Canadian man on Mondays, I start the engine softly and shovel the surrounding snow. I let her warm up and come alive, regain her senses, for no vehicle rises from bed, ready to face the street. In the room, I let her roam. Every time an idea struggles for air, she, crash she scratches with her unkempt nails the wooden floors, waiting for language until it unfurls, easing the crisis. What do I do with this vehicle of mine? I cannot park her, abandon her anywhere. When I go shopping, my wheels shatter the glossy ceramic floors. And when I go to the beach, she sinks into the sand. Small and dark complected and broken, her windows are an almanac of winds and her voice falters at rush hour. Thank you. Uh, just Thank you. go ahead. Okay, I'm I'm just gonna mention something um, about Nashua as a translator because I think Nashua has like an amazing range of um, like a, so many different sets of eyes. Uh, she was saying earlier that she needs to listen to a poem when she um, is edit editing it, um, and she's also like very good with grammar, uh, <laughs> much better than I am. So she's also. Uh, but then there are also other um, sensory materials that she's really attuned to. Um, and and um, so in this particular poem, she um, in the line that says she sinks into the sand. Um, so it was really difficult to, to translate the word because it's like 
it's it comes with an image of uh, like something like a vehicle in particular sinking its wheels into the sand. For some reason, I have no idea why, but I had changed the line to she sinks her teeth into the sand. I think I was playing with the idea of the vehicle and the body and like um, animating the vehicle somehow. Um, and then Nesha was like, I really don't like the 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 this um, idea of sand and teeth. It just makes me cringe. So, and also it's not like the original at all. Um, so we we took it out the teeth thing, um, which I I really don't know how it got there in the first place. But uh, but yeah, and and there were were other instances as well of Nashua saying like ah, uh, um, that just it doesn't sit right with me and on a sensory level so yeah well thank you Nashua if there's anything you want to say about it um, I was just going to say thank you Sarah that's very kind but now we're going to get all these people saying I like the tea <laughs> or bring back the tea I was going to say yeah I mean I like both versions but um when with with the teeth the 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 vehicle has more power as if it's you know it's able to to resist the sand while um with sinking you, you're just surrendered which is i feel is is more the feel of the poem right like the helplessness um yeah <laughs> so i just wanted to say that um people are adding lots of clapping emojis into the comments so it's it's a little bit weird in in an online event, but but they're there. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is um, friendship in in the collection, and this is maybe one of my personal obsessions because I feel like so much of literature is taken up by romantic love, but whereas other loves and particularly friendship and the and the love of friendship. Um, is a large part of human life and friend breakups as well. And I wondered, uh, I, I felt that either, either I'm projecting it in there or I felt that this is an important part of um, uh, this an, a motif in the, in the collection. And whether you were sort of consciously working to explore the, the love of friendship in your poetry or if it just sort of appeared there as one of your interests. Um, yeah, I really love that you caught this question. Like this, it feels great to get this question and even the humor question because I'm like, you know, these are things that I notice about my poetry. I notice it while Sarah is translating, and I'm just like, is anyone noticing? You know, <laughs> that there is like these persistent poem, um, sorry, themes or patterns or you know, um. So I like it's 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 really funny because like. A month ago, I was, I just like sat and realized I was like, I rarely have love poems. Like, what's wrong with me? Even though, <laughs> you know, like the first thing I would do when I um, come across a poet, you know, um, is look for their love poems. You know, I'm, I'm always like, you know, it's really hard to write a love poem. Um, yet it, you know, once you read a good one, um, you just you feel like you throw yourself um at the arms of this poet and feel like you know you have a bond with them and you're willing to look at all of their work and if there's something you don't like you would you know overlook it you know <laughs> you establish like this compassion as a reader but i um yeah i i have very few love poems and then i tried to write a poem a month ago called a love poem and in which i talk about failing to write a love poem <laughs> You know, and I would say, you know, this connects to your question of humor, because I've had all these misconceptions, these really masculine, mis literary misconceptions of what a woman can write, you know, of so we, women writers are expected to write love poems, and therefore I prohibited myself from writing love poems, you know, everything you expect me to, I will not do it, you know, so I go write about, you know, uh, uh, friendship. Um, and then, you know, over time, I also realized like that all of these friendship like poems, some of them, of course, like are, um, I love how you described it, it's like a friendship breakup, you know, and, and some of them were actually, you know, after breakups with friend, losing a friend, you know, just, you know, having an argument or, you know, disagreement with a friend and, 
you know, I would like get emotional and <laughs> write a poem to commemorate, commemorate that friendship. And, and, you know, I still like, whenever I look back at this, at, um, I remember vividly like my friend from college who um you know I lost her friendship because of a guy really <laughs> you know so um love inside a friendship you know so um so uh but I I start to realize also like how much you know um there is some queerness to my friendship poems as well. And, you know, in the new collection that I'm working on, I'm trying to be more intentional about that, you know? I used to make it very subtle, but then you start to realize once you become your like full queer self, I guess, <laughs> you know, or like a blossomed self, you know, you start to realize like, no, there was always a queerness to this, you know, friendship that I, that I, that I couldn't recognize because society says, it's it's platonic friendship and that's it you know and and it must stay as so but it was love you know it was always love you know you fall in love with your friends all the time um and sometimes your friends are like they know you on on a much deeper level than say family or you know um sometimes even in romance and um so the fact that this this theme or subject you know remained with me uh, throughout my work, you know, it just, um, um, I feel there's something unique about, like, the fact that I was not totally surrendered to the hierarchy of human relations, right, like, family is more sacred than mm -hmm. romance, than friends, and so on, like, um, and similarly, I have strangers always show up in my poems, you know, and how much I love strangers, I love running into them, I love, like, I wrote a poem about quitting cigarettes and how it endangers my exposure to strangers, you know, like that would, you know, I don't, I, you know, lose, it's it, losing smoking is about losing strangers too, or coincidence, right? And and then life becomes an algorithm. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going away with this, but I just feel, um, um, I, I love that this thread is, is there, yet I still feel like I, I, now face a, a like a challenge to write <laughs> a love poem that is you know as expected so sara i wanted to ask if it's okay um the sort of the relationship role the friendship role in in translation in in this relationship in making these poems come alive in in another language um yeah i so i've i've translated um uh, other people but i think mona is um the person i've worked longest with and uh have translated most substantially and we're also um we've become good friends along the process and and i friendship is very important to me and uh it's one of the few things in my life i feel like i've been good at uh not always but uh <laughs> um so yeah it's very exciting for me to be able to incorporate that kind of intimacy um and friendship into a work practice uh where because I can be very serious about work um sometimes just like a perfectionist and very finicky and uh which is all like they're all um, not negative emotions per se, but just anxiety inducing. And then, so the friendship element softens my approach to the work. Um, and yet, so I'm I'm excited when I send Mona poems to read like um, my translations, my drafts. Uh, and I'm like, it's as if I'm sharing something with her that I made for her. Um, like a, a tiny gift or or something. It's not that I'm, uh, you know what I mean, but it's like, she's going to open the poems and then, uh, and I'm not nervous because we've developed a practice of uh, like, even if she disagrees with my choices, there's like, I don't, I don't really take it personally at all. It's like, oh, let's see how else we can do this uh, because there's, like a, a kindness and um, tenderness between us. So it's just like a very positive experience for me. Um, and I think I, I feel free um, or I have, I feel like I have autonomy and space with uh, Mona's work and with Mona as a writer that I'm the translator of. 
um, to also make my own decisions. Um, so, and I'm sure that's that's been created between us. Uh, the more the trust grows, that I I am um, allowed to make changes if I want to. But then also that goes back to Mona being like such an open um, poet um, and someone who embraces change. So I I feel like sometimes if she realizes that a poem can go in a different direction she's like oh okay let's let's change it let's um and uh yeah okay I um can I jump in here even though I know we're sort of we're reaching some of the time um I just wanted to say that obviously the poet and translator the relationship between the, the poet and the translator is so intimate and in this situation because I'm outside of it I'm the editor I'm actually really jealous <laughs> because you know their their relationship is obviously you know came long before um I came into the picture but also it's it's very very intense and intimate and um, even though I came to this project through Mona, you know, we I was discussing it with Mona initially, I quickly kind of, the relationship became uh, me and Sara because we were discussing the translations then so intimately. Um, and that Sara and I sparked a, a really good friendship. And I actually, I genuinely cannot wait for the three of us to meet um, in the summer for the, to, to tour the book. Um, but yeah, there, there's something about kind of even the backgrounds of the three of us, you know, all from the Middle East, all women, all poets, translators, you know, um and probably editors as well so it's it's been a really interesting dynamic and um but I'm also just very excited to see how Mona and Sarah how close they have been um and also knowing that yeah any conversation that we have on the translation is being relayed back to Mona straight away but at the same time we know that Mona is like Sarah is saying just kind of giving you complete freedom and sort of ownership over the English ones as well so yeah, I just want to say the friendship is there, but I am still very envious of the two of them. Well, so um, could we read Journey to the Catacombs of the Heart? I would just. Yeah. The way to the heart of the heart. I wanted to put a stone on the heart. I wanted to put a stone on the heart in a way that I wanted to put صديقة أخرى تنتحر من نافذة قلبي هل لي أن أتشبث بحجابها الأبيض لأنقذها؟ لربما نصف صديقة وجه يحبني وآخر متجهم أعلم كانت تغسل ثيابها يوميا من نكات السخيفة أعلم أيضا جنود صغار حولوا وسادتها لساحة معركة جعلوني قائدا عسكريا يقصف أحلامه من سيحدثني الآن يا صديقتي؟ عن عاشق وهمي سأترك الأكواب فارغة فحتى الشاي يا صديقتي لن ينقذك من موتك Okay, uh, this is Journey to the Catacombs of the Heart I forgot to install an emergency staircase I forgot to construct my heart closer to the ground Another friend has flung herself from the window of my heart. Can I still grab hold of her white veil? Can I save her? Perhaps she was only half a friend, one countenance loving, the other sullen. I know she cleansed her clothes daily of my silly jokes. I also know how tiny soldiers converted her pillow into a battlefield. I was cast as a military commander, shelling her dreams. Who will talk to me now of make-believe lovers? I will leave the cups empty, for even tea, my friend, will not rouse you from your death. Thank you. Thank you, Sara. Okay, so I don't think we have time for my last question. So if you want to hear the amazing poem, Genetics, you just have to get the collection. Um, I do wanna take a little bit of time for people's questions. Um, one, one I think is a very straightforward question. They want to know where you'll be touring with the book this summer. Yeah, um, we will, um, will be in, in July for the first two weeks in July. Uh, we will announce the um, details on social media, also Poetry Center, I'm sure we'll promote it. 
um, they are the ones organizing it. So we'll be at uh, different literary festivals in the UK, but only in the UK. But if, um, I don't know, if you want us elsewhere, you should demand us. <laughs> Excellent. So I know that you'll be at Shebek Festival. Uh, anywhere yes. else in particular, people can look for you? Um, yes, Shebek Festival, Liverpool Festival, uh, Ledbury Festival, and um, also um, a couple of events in London that are not festival related. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then um, I'm curious to know how Arabic and English influence each other in your imagination. This is for Mona and whether your bilingualism affects your process, thinking, choosing topics. Yes, absolutely. And um, I think if I may answer for Sarah too, you know, it, it, I see it in her poetry as well. And I see it in her, you know, the way she approaches the translation. And I, I find this is like one of the qualities that you know, she has as a, as a, um, as a poet and um, as a translator too, you know, um, I, I was going to say even about the question that we had uh, of friendship and, you know, translators is that um, I mostly hear terrible stories <laughs> about, you know, translators with authors, you know, it's really sad, like, but um, a lot of the times they are hierarchical, a lot of the times authors are, have essentialist ideas of like text, right? Um, and uh, authenticity and, you know, um, ownership, you know, I, I refuse all of these. But also I was always scared of being translated or being involved in when translated, you know. Um, so I used to always like, you know, take a quick look and if there is just like something um, wrong, like for example, like the wrong word, right? Like I would say, I would correct that and, um, and that's it, you know, and not be involved in anything. But with Sarah, like, um, she works on this on every level. Like she talked about how she works on the level of the sentence, but she thinks about translating it across forms, for example, translating, you know, um, what if we lose something with humor, what do we compensate it with, right? If, you know, uh, if there's a cultural expression, do we keep it as it is and make it an awkward poetic or do we, you know, use something else. So there is a poem that hasn't come out yet. It's called Lost in Translation. And in that poem, it's just it, the idea of this poem came because I keep saying these English sentences in Arabic that people are like, you know, so I would say, um, for example, like my phone died. You can't say this in Arabic and telephone you might, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's like saying my phone is deceased, right? So I, um, I um, started to accumulate these expressions, you know, but then also the same thing when I say things, I, um, I, I say close the light, you know, instead of saying turn off the light, right? So um, it, like, I always have these things that like, it doesn't matter how long I've been living, you know, uh, in an English speaking world, like I still have them. And sometimes, you know, with the, the English world would, would, you know, slip or leak into my Arabic world as well. Um, so, um, you know, it's been like, yeah, this is a poetic for sure, you know, and this is, and I remember when I was a monolingual reader reading Arabic translations of poetry of, you know, from different cultures and seeing that and not knowing the context and the origin and still enjoying them, right? Enjoying them as something, you know, um, yeah, just different and new and fresh, right? Um, so, um, yeah, and, and I think this is exactly something that Sarah is aware of and, and, you know, she tries to be, you know, to, to play along with it, right? Like to, to embrace this playfulness um, of it. So this isn't exactly a question, but Syed has posted it into my, um, into my chat. So from Jasmine Khalil, I just want to close on this. She says, all women from the Middle East, all poets, translators, and editors, we should see more examples of this proud to the roof, she says. So um, thank you everybody for, for coming today. And thank you to you three for your um, insights into, into this work. And I encourage, um, Majda did ask, I did, I think put the book buying link in the, in the YouTube comments. Otherwise, it is available at Poetry Translation Center and hopefully wherever fine books are sold. 
So thanks everybody for coming thank and I really you. encourage everybody to get this. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you, everyone.